Welcome back to the official Geek Speak podcast. I'm your host, Sean, and join as always is my co-host, Josh Thundercrack, Rudy Rudolph. This is the podcast where we watch movies, make movies, play games, and more. What else can you ask for? Josh, how was Pixels? I know you watched that recently. Oh, Lord. It was... <laughs> I saw it back in 2015. I didn't see get to see it in the theaters, even though I really wanted to. It is... It's not good. It is very much... You can tell that Adam Sandler was kind of done with these kind of movies back then, or at least on the studio level, because he still makes these kinds of movies for Netflix, or at least was. It's just... It's bad. It's There are so many things in the script but that Peter do Dinklage. not... I don't know what he was doing. He had some weird accent. I couldn't place where it was from in America, but it was weird. And this was at the, like the height of his Game of Thrones popularity. So I don't know. It was just bad. And what's funny is, is that back in 2015, Kevin James as the president sounds like a very funny idea. But now today, after what we've had in our political landscape, it's a surprisingly great satire. Even though I don't think that was the plan. Would you still want to do a Goonies style Pixels movie in the 70s? Yes, Dead. that's what it should be. It should have been about kids in the 80s fighting aliens that are using video game characters. And I'm not talking about the way that this movie does it. I'm talking about just them taking video game characters, bringing them to life. Or if you do it modern, you can have God of War and Ellie and Joel. And... Then everyone would die. <laughs> also fair. I did watch Zathura for the first time ever. I loved that movie when I was a kid. I've also watched uh, John Wick Chapter 4. The more I think about it, the more it might be my favorite. Chapter 2 is still there, but, like, I really love 4. And then I saw the Zach Braff movie, A Good Place, with uh, Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman. You mean it, a good person? Yes. I What did I say? You said A Good Place, like the show The Good Place. <laughs> <laughs> no, A Good Person. Uh, yes, that was the movie I saw. It's not, uh, not great. Uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in it, but it definitely doesn't have, like, the right ideas in some places. Or, no, the best execution, that's why it, it doesn't. It looks really like. cute, though, and fun. I like I like cute and fun. Yes. And then I saw Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, very great time. If this is not the first fantasy heist movie, or if it is, why have there not been more? Like, that is such a cool the way. Yeah. That's what the whole part of The Hobbit is, a fantasy heist. That's, it's a, no. But they dragged out three movies, I mean, n none of them were individually a fantasy heist movie. It's not, it is, but it also isn't. It's a very boring way to do a heist. It just that's goes fair. go sneak and take it and then leave. Like, that's not what a heist is. You have but to have a very complicated plan. He fails at that. If you're new to the podcast, Josh and I are both filmmakers, and we love pop culture, and we love diving into uh, an array of different things in comics and movies and games and just talking about it together since it's also way to keep connected since we're so far away right now. Um, in most episodes, we go to a different Disney Channel original movie, or DCOM for short, and we see how in a short period of time the biggest media company on Earth, Disney, caters towards solely children with a large sample size. We'll see quality changes, etc. But instead, we prepped today. We did. We were preparing for the apocalypse that is Jack Black as Bowser. Or the savior um, that is Jack Black as Bowser. It just depends on who you ask. But then, to prepare for Jack Black as Bowser, we watched uh, uh, we watched Dennis Hooper as Bowser first, as King Koopa. It's um, it's a choice. It's different. It's different. The, the whole so film did, is a choice. <laughs> we did not watch a DCOMS episode. Instead, we watched the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie, which they do say in the movie Super Mario Brothers in this, at one point near the end. Yes. Like, that's kind of fun in a, in a very like ham-fisted way. His ham fist? That's not a term. Ham fisted? I thought that was. I don't know what I'm saying anymore, man. Who, who needs words? Am. Who needs words? So, um, I don't know how to begin talking about this movie besides. I, I, if you're if familiar at seen... all with <laughs> terrible video game adaptations, this is the film that started it all, sadly. But... And if it's been destroyed on the internet for decades now. I want to focus more on just instead of good or bad as we have this discussion, more about just the movie itself and our reactions to certain things. Just talking about the weirdness of it because I think it's more fun than just saying this movie didn't do well. But we know that at this point. It's been twenty years, thirty years. Wow, it's thirty years this year. Wow, jeez. What's What's funny is is that I honestly don't think this is like the worst thing ever. Like that's all I've ever heard of it's about a this low movie. Bar, Josh. <laughs> well, I think it's okay. I think it's fun. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying that it's not fun. Like, 
I think that there's a lot of fun in the right ways, a lot of fun in the wrong ways. As an adaptation of Mario, it's, it's awful, <laughs> but it's I think they did it yeah. knowingly. Like they were just like, let's do this, but let's do it in this kind of way. Let's and it's it's a choice. It's not a choice I would have gone with, but I kind of respected to a certain degree. I totally do. I think it's a bad adaptation, but a, an actually decent movie if you just look at it as its own thing and just have fun with it. It feels like it's the same world as like 1999 Batman, Ghostbusters, and like Ninja Turtles and stuff. That's that same weird nebulous zone of almost New York. Yeah, this was the era of like blockbusters where there wasn't like any kind of definitive blueprint. Like a lot of films just emulated one another just to see what would stick. And what's funny is, is that have... like things like the practical effects in this like are honestly not bad. The designs of some of them are horrifying, but as like effects go, like it's actually pretty impressive for some of them. Want to hear a fun fact? I like facts that are fun. Dennis Hopper, who uh, played King Koopa in this, who wasn't a king actually, he was a, he's a democratically elected person. Um, explained why he did the film. He said, "I made a picture called Super Mario Brothers, and my six year old at the time, he's now eighteen. He said, Dad." I think you're probably a pretty good actor, but why did you play that terrible uh, guy, King Koopa, in Super Mario Bros? And I said, well, Henry, I did that so you could have shoes. And he said, Dad, I don't need shoes that badly. <laughs> there is there is so much behind-the-scenes drama and stuff behind this movie. We could go on forever talking about it. If you're curious at all, look it up. But what's funny is, is from hearing all that, I expected an absolute like shit show. Like None of this would have made any sense. And like... You can follow what's happening. Like, there is a story that's happening that is present that you can follow the narrative from beginning to end, and it makes sense. And, like, from the way um, that it's always been described to me, I'm like, this must be an incoherent mess. And supposedly, Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo were drinking a lot on set as well, because they had to deal with a lot of so much drama. And you can't tell in the movie when they're drunk or not. That's called good acting. <laughs> it really is. Also, Michael Keaton was almost Koopa. There's a lot of weird casting for this for this movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger turned down King Koopa. You know what? At that time in his career, that was a smart choice. I think it's interesting they chose Daisy over Toadstool slash Peach. Do you think they really looked at the video games? They're like, all right, let's look at what these characters are. They're probably just like, here's a list of characters. Uh, we'll go with the main ones and then I the think first Toad girl. alone shows they didn't choose anything. Yeah, to, uh, the way Toad is, the way Yoshi is, the way Bowser is, like Toad is, Toad is just Toad in name only. Oh, one hundred percent. There are no uh, mushroom people in this. But I actually like they did Mushroom Kingdom a little bit. It's kind of clever with the. We'll get into that. Okay, let's talk, let's talk about some plot. So Mario and his adopted son brother Luigi. They kind of half explain this and also kind of don't. It's best to not question it and just roll with it. Mario is his mom, uh, literally what he calls himself at one point. Um, Luigi doesn't have a family, and so Mario found him and brought him in, which is a nice thing. So they're not really brothers, even though they call themselves the Mario brothers. Also, their last names are Mario, which I knew about ahead of time. It's, uh, a, cause that, it's a choice, to say the least. That's the only, but that's the only way it makes sense to have Mario brothers. Because I, I'm not going to call you, um, you and your brother, I'm not going to call the Josh brothers. What we call be called Josh Squared then? No, because it, you're you going your last name. Oh, I go with the Rudolph brothers because that's what makes sense. They're this part is the same name. So Mario, Mario, and Luigi, Mario. How many Mario's are among the two of you? Three Mario's, sir. What's funny is is that there are some actual like not terribly written jokes like but it's just a direction that's bad and I think that's because one of the writers that came in to do some rewrites on this was the writer of Men in Black. So I think that explains that. It also has a lot of Men in Black vibes to it, honestly. Yeah. Like, this, this movie... If, if you don't care about Mario, it's not bad. I stand by that. I actually had fun. It's weird. It definitely is. But the film knows that. There's some world logic things that you just roll with and don't think about it too much. And just go with it just to see the insanity of it. And, it, like, you, it's kind of endearing. If you switched out the words, like any any of the game references, like in terms of names, and made them just instead of Mario Brothers and stuff like that, it'd be just like you know Phil and Frank and stuff like that. Uh, this would be a cult classic. People would love it. I like, think it's just because of the adaptation, it gets so much hurt. Oh yeah, for sure. Like that does not do it any favors. But I think even um, the creator of Mario himself was just like, I don't hate, I don't hate the film. Like there's there's some quote from him about it, but like he's not like furious at it. There's like aspects of it that he wishes like were different, like about the process of it and everything. 
I also think it's funny they just found those jumpsuits at the end randomly. That's never really explained. Yeah, um, just just go with it. Of, there's a lot of movie that's not really explained, and I'm kind of fine with that. Uh, King Coop was a 65 million years ago. The asteroid that hit that destroyed the dinosaurs didn't destroy the dinosaurs. It sent them to an alternate dimension. <laughs> Yes, uh, an alternate dimension where the dinosaurs mutate into human-like people. Yeah, and it's supposed to be like the, instead of evolving from... Also, we don't evolve from apes, which is a very weird thing this movie makes a decision on. This was the 90s, that's what they thought. <laughs> Flash forward to modern-ish day. A woman, who we'd never see, uh, after this, drops a baby off at a church and runs away. And then Koopa, a guy named Koopa finds her. And this is in our world, and takes captures her. That baby grows up to be twenty years later, Princess Daisy. Uh, the the thing to also remember <laughs> is that she was dropped off at the orphanage not as the baby, as an egg. That's true. She hatches from an egg. <laughs> I forgot about that part just then. I watched this last night. Uh, do you think he knows this movie, Josh? Not really. I kept. I tried to keep some mental notes. <laughs> Yeah, same. Like the fact that at one point Yoshi got stabbed. Okay, so here's my thing. So Koopa has this machine that can de-evolve or evolve people, and he de-evolves people into the Goombas, which are these giant, hulking, tiny head dinosaur things. Why don't they just call them Koopas? I don't know. But the weird thing to me about it is that I can understand the head shrinking. What I don't understand is how it grows their bodies, because it only affects their heads, because that's what the machine does. It goes over their heads. It doesn't go over their whole bodies. So how is it transforming into these giant things? <laughs> Clearly someone in the back is just stuffing their shirts. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but what's also weird is that it has an evolve switch, and he, like, evolves the intelligence of his two henchmen who are like morons and I'm just like why'd you not do that before why don't you make everyone smart if you had that technology also the names are Spike and Iggy which are actually like Bowser's kids in the games too because <laughs> uh, Bowser has many children like you know Bowser Jr. Spike Iggy uh, Lemmy there's more bad hair yeah <laughs> Daisy who dropped off as an egg grew up later then we have in, and this is in Queens we have Mario and Luigi, you know, Luigi, the adopted son brother of Mario, uh, who's a slacker, looks playing video games, watch, watching sports, you know, being a normal kind of cool guy. Also, this this is not the Mario movie. This is, this is the Luigi movie. Oh, yeah. Luigi is the main character, not Mario, which is an interesting thing. Also, well, I wouldn't say falls... main character. He's more the focus. Luigi also falls in, falls in love with these, like says the, love, the L word within like two days. It was 90s romance. He knows her for one date. It's called 90s Romance. You date once and then you go to marry the prince. That's how it works. They're plumbers. They have an arch enemy. And that arch enemy is a contractor who is destroying an archaeology site, which is where Daisy comes in. Cause that's where she she's a student who studies archaeology. Because, you know, she has to like dinosaurs. She is part dinosaur. Of course. What's what's funny is is like they keep getting like calls of like hey we got like a leaking sink we need plumbers and they don't call the Mari brothers specifically they put out the call to like I guess a plumber channel or something like that it's just like hey we need this someone come help us like that's not how it works or at least I don't no. think that's how it works <laughs> maybe the nineties Josh we're too young apparently to know how this works that is true they had, was... they had pay phones in this that's how old they are <laughs> and that was important that's actually a plot point. Why she walk so far from the dig site to find a payphone? I feel like that in the 90s, there were payphones on every street corner. The Mario Luigi's arch enemy in the real world, the contract guy, um, he starts digging in this dig site and breaks a hole through to the other dimension, naturally. That's where the entirety of King Koo's end up ending plot falls apart. There's a meteorite. The last piece of the meteorite to destroy the dinosaurs uh, is worn on the necklace of Daisy all the time. She doesn't know what it is. She just thinks it's a pretty rock like her mom left her. Which, that's a fine detail, why not? So King Koopa wants to merge the two worlds and conquer both lands. And the way to do that is by going to that world and conquering that land. And he, in his eyes, he can only do that with the rock. But he sends goons to the other world to get the rock in her. If you can walk to the other dimension now, because it's opened, you can go over there and conquer. Yeah, like, there's, his... there's, there's a lot of things with the... With the whole his plan, whole, that's weird. His whole weird. plan is, I want to go to the other world and conquer them. Your portal's open, bud. Well, no, the you need the rock to to do it because it. Well, no, I don't. Mm. No, you don't, because uh, Spike and Iggy were already across. I, 
yeah there there's also a lot Isn't of stuff that a bad this... plot yeah there's a lot of stuff when you really think about it, does not work or make sense <laughs> But besides that, the actual Mushroom Kingdom slash Dino, Dino Hatton is what it's called. Is kind of fun. It's like Blade Runnery. It's like Men in Blacky. You know uh, what? What's honestly like really fascinating to me is just the giant sets and effects that they have for this. Like you can tell they put money into this movie. Like it feels like a real lived in place. Um, I mentioned earlier Toad. You might picture Toad like uh, Keegan Michael Key's Toad in the new movie, you know, a small mushroom boy with a little blue vest. He's a rocker in here. He has a little, <laughs> yeah. And then it gets turned into a Goomba almost immediately. Yep. And it's never. And again, Goombas. I don't think we can, we can prepare you enough for this image of a Goomba in this movie if you've not seen them already. Just look at what small a Goomba is. Head. Just look at what Goomba is from the Mario games, and then look at the movie. And I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you can't tell that they're not the same thing. There's also some surprising casting in this, like Fiona Shaw, who was Aunt Petunia in Harry Potter, is one of the main villain people. It was weird hearing her with a not British accent. It was weird seeing her not look like like the the hair and the outfits. It's like, oh, yeah. you're not designed to look evil in this movie. It's weird. We also have um, Francesca P. Roberts, who played a character named Big Bertha, who was at the bar. Her main job was to be large, sassy black woman. What I don't get is that she steals the rock from Mario and Luigi, and like very clearly, like it's she should be able to recognize them because because they go back to the bar later on to steal it, and she just doesn't seem to recognize them. And Mario like just swoons her and like makes her fall in love with him. Right, she got the rock from them, and I don't, uh, there's no reason why she just takes it. <laughs> I will say, when the old lady was uh, trying to rob them, that was honestly kind of funny. I agree. You got got any weapons? No. Well, here's mine. (laughs) Well, stick them up. Oh, interesting. So Koopa and Bowser are different different people, apparently. Bowser's in this movie. So apparently, Lance Henriksen, who plays the, the mushroom fungus, is named King Bowser. What? In the credits. So that means that Daisy in this is the daughter of Bowser? Bowser and King Koopa is not Bowser. What? <laughs> Interesting choices. I thought it was gonna be that her mom was Peach. It's just And then like and then Marty would fall for Peach and then Luigi would fall for Daisy. But Bertha, a lot of people think that she's based off of the giant red fish because he's covered in red sparkles and like scale like things the whole time. Who knows? Given this film's logic, I wouldn't be surprised. Luigi goes on a date with Daisy. He meets her at this phone booth. He's really bad talking to girls, apparently, in this scene only. Correct. And then later on, he's fine. Because uh, as we, as anyone with social anxiety knows, it's only one bad conversation, and then the rest is smooth sailing. Mario helps him, his, his, his dad, brother, and they go on a double date with Mario's apparent girlfriend, who we see like, a few times in the movie. Yes, and he is, he's only concerned about her a little bit because she gets kidnapped by uh, by Bowser's two kids because they don't know what Daisy looks well, in like. in this, they're cousins. Cousins, kids, what? Do you think this movie cares? Slightly? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> but she gets kidnapped think- because they think that she's Daisy because she, is a, she has arms and legs. <laughs> Even though they all oh, yeah. have arms and legs. I don't understand how they can't tell. Uh... Because the movie makes it very clear they can't tell mammals apart sometimes. Um, but they look the exact same as your dino people do. Yeah, like, there's very, very, very few dino people in Dino Hand that actually, like, have reptilian things about them. Because most people just look like humans. It's a bizarre time. Like, the only pure and... dinosaur in it is Yoshi, which is also a weird thing. No, there are a few dino kids, like small ones. Oh, well, then I missed that. Look, rat size. I want to talk about the fact that Mar- so Mario and Luigi, after their double date with Daisy and Daniela as Mario's girlfriend, Daisy gets kidnapped. And they chase Daisy and the kidnappers, who are Spike and Iggy, through these pipes and stuff. They end up following her through a giant rock wall portal to what is Dino Haddon slash the Mushroom Kingdom. And they just say Mushroom Kingdom one time near the end because Daisy's dad is a giant fungus. I love how invested they are in saving this woman they just met. That does prove the whole, like, they're actually good, decent people thing, I guess. Yeah, they just want to save her and everything, which is, you know, good. I, I like that's it. That's noble. 
I, I will say it's pretty funny. Like what Mario's like one of his character traits is how much he loves plumbing. Well, that makes sense. He's a plumber. <laughs> Your tools are really important. I've made very clear in this. But I just think it's funny that that's like one of the few character traits he has is just like I love plumbing and pipes. They also never I, go down any pipes in this. How dare they? No. I love how anti cop this movie is. <laughs> yes. Um, one thing that's weird though is like with so the cop cars don't run on like electric they don't run on gas or anything which i guess makes sense with the world but like the way that they drive oh, around is like yes, through gas is dinosaur bones yeah but like <laughs> they they use electricity but like not every place has like the electrical grids up top for the cars to like attach to to run so i'm just wondering like how they run when they don't have those grids then yeah they're, they're kind of like cable cars yeah, which which makes sense, but then like when they're not using the cable car esque stuff, then how are they running? Uh, magic of dinos. I do like that a fungus does decide to help them over time slightly with small things. Yeah, so that's... fungus again being the father of Daisy, trying to help her, trying to help her heroes save her do- his daughter. But then that just makes you wonder, like, is it when it's everywhere? Is that him? And like, if a piece gets torn off of him, is that like someone like breaking a finger off of him? I guess it's more like cutting hair at that point. Because there's one, like, you know, fungus blob, that's what he is, so... Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Why would he keep the place hot, though, that makes fungus grow? When he wanted to, like, stay cold so the fungus dies? Also, why did he not just kill him? <laughs> there's so many weird te- technological things with this. Like, there's com- there are computer screens that hook up to, like, surveillance and sound systems. They have to point, like a like, a Nintendo power gun at them to, like, select stuff. And I'm just like... Was that really the most efficient way to do it? <laughs> like, was there no the random, other ways? Yeah, that was weird. The, the random joke about King Koopa ordering pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more fascinated in the world than anything else. Yeah. I, I don't think this movie is Citizen Kane level. No. But I, it's definitely you lucky dog level. Yes, there have been far worse video game adaptations and far worse movies than this. But I think just because this was like the first one, then people will just hold it to that standard of like, this is the worst thing ever made. I'm like, calm down, guys. It's it's okay at best. It's not great, but it's not terrible. It set up a sequel. That I never happened. That sequel. I want to see it. Because I'm just, but she never says like what, what it is. Like what? Like what happened? At least like Back to the Future was just like something's got to be done about your kids. And she's like, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." She's just like, "You gotta come with me," and then that's it. <laughs> oh yeah, at the end, uh, Daisy stops them. They stop them. Stop the world's merging. Marty uses the bomb because the bomb is accurate in this, mostly because it doesn't. It should have stopped. It should have exploded a lot sooner based on how the bombs work in the games. Why didn't he just throw it at him? He doesn't know how it works. He, it's a bomb! You throw them, usually! <laughs> Not Mario, they just kind of walk. It was like the size of a golf ball. He could have easily thrown it. No, but in the Mario games, it just walks. So, like, let's keep this one part accurate. Because that's where they draw the line, the bombs. He, they defeat King Koopa, who I also am very confused on why, as a dictator, he lets himself even have elections. Ah. He has, like, vote Koopa everywhere. Like, this is your world. You are literally the king at this point. How did the mushroom boy, the the Bowser, literally named King Bowser, apparently, how did he become back to normal? That part isn't explained, right? I thought that he got transformed into goo, and that was it. No, no, no. King Koopa. Got oh! King, King Bowser, the original boy. The OG Daisy uh, dad. I guess when Koopa died, that released the fungus infection right? thing. It, it's not I explained. don't know. Because I thought, because he de-evolved him to be fungus, so I thought they were just going to use the same thing to, you know, evolve him back. I thought so too. But they didn't. <laughs> also, like when they were freezing, like you know, stuff around, that was also like I thought that was killing off the fungus. Which, in effect, wouldn't that be killing her father? Well, she didn't know at first. No, they didn't know that. They didn't know either. No, they did. When they started freezing, she knew that was him. No, but he, Mario and Luigi didn't know that at that point. Yeah, They're they did. <laughs> what? Okay. This movie's weird. If you if you can, it's on Amazon. We got we both got it for like three bucks each. <laughs> we bought on DVD. You cannot find it on any streaming service or on any digital stores. You have to buy it on DVD. I actively had fun. 
I was not and bored I, once watching it. Not at all. I love that Yoshi was actually a, a puppet. I love that. The effects were overall really cool. Like, even if they were not what you wanted them to be, they were unique. Like, the only time the effects were bad was when it was, like, blue screen stuff. That was when it was at its worst. When Mario was flying on Luigi's shoes? When it was that, when he was, when Mario fell through the dimension for the first time, I was just like, that's, that's bad. Even for 93, that's bad. We open up with a pixelated Luigi narration. Over a I thought it was Mario. Group. I don't know who it was at the beginning. It was some uh, Italian-American person. <laughs> Uh, and it was very pixely, like, like like a video game. It opened up two dinosaurs, and that was fun. Like, okay, I see what you're doing here. Do you know that the Yoshi puppet was capable of making 64 separate movements to 200 feet of cable crammed inside the three-foot structure? Good lord. And no this... less than nine puppeteers were used to cre create uh, make Yoshi work. You know what's funny? This came out the same year that Jurassic Park did. That's pretty cool. This is also constantly re rewritten on set. Oh yeah, I was so if, I was doing a deep dive on like all on all this stuff. I'm like, man, hearing all this, I'm surprised that we got a competent story, like one that you could follow from beginning to end. Also, the game series isn't consistent in what kind of things are going to happen with the character and what's going on in his life. Yeah, so this is honestly as accurate as it, it potentially could. Like at the time, I get it's not accurate to like the core of Mario games, but looking back now. It's a pretty accurate depiction of the spirit of Mario. For for live action, like, at the time, like, what other way would they have done this? I don't think there would have been another way. <laughs> Just Mario Kart. Make it a racing movie. Oh, Lord. Quarter his Ferrari with Yoshi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not the worst game adaptation. Not the worst movie. I would watch it again, but I have no desire to right now. I love how murderous Mario is in this. There is quite a bit of murder in this. You no, know, like he talks about like saying I'm gonna kill him a bunch of times. I'm like Mario, you know your favorite childhood plumber and character. Talk about murdering people a lot in this. Okay, to be fair, the Mario games have a very high body count. <laughs> you can literally jump on Yoshi and then drop him in a pit. <laughs> We're moving on, Josh. Are you okay with that? Sure. Yeah, you're nay. I'll give an indifferent yay. I'm giving a high yay. It's so much fun. Okay, it's not... Okay, I'm not trying to praise too highly, because it's, like, it's not amazing, but, like, it's... A, I was never bored. No. And I would watch this again over a lot of other bad adaptations. Like, I would not watch The Last Airbender over, over this, for instance. Yeah, anyone that says this is one of the worst movies ever made, I'm sorry, you have not seen enough movies to make that criticism. I think it's time we talk about the news, though, of the time of the episode, Josh. Things have happened recently. So, every episode we go through a bunch of different news of pop culture and stuff, and, like, TV and movies, and, um, last episode that's out currently, uh, our Quantum Mania discussion, which is two episodes ago now, we were praising Jonathan Majors a lot in his performance as Kang, which, yeah, gave a good performance. Uh, the episode that came out... <laughs> I mean, the day the day that came out, we got some news about Jonathan Majors. It's pretty, it's pretty um, bad news. He seems like very clearly abused his girlfriend. Yes, the if you if you read the text that she sent trying to say don't press charges, that's clearly a victim who's obsessed with their, with their abuser. Yeah, it is. Um, it is not clearing his name in any way, shape, or form. It, it makes it worse. We're not going to touch more on that um, because. That's not good, and I'm glad we don't currently have Ezra news, but we do have now this. Uh, moving on to interesting news, though, in a movie that is uh, movie news that is similar to the disaster that it was Mario. Did you watch the trailer for Big Shark, Tommy Wiseau's first film since The Room? See, at first I was just like, oh, yes, another Tommy Wiseau movie. And then I I realized because someone like on Twitter had like pointed this out, he's not trying to make a good film. He's trying to be like, oh look guys, I made on the joke. I know I'm a bad filmmaker, so here's a movie called Big Shark. I'm just like, that's not why we like the room, dude. And I just don't think that it's gonna be good because he's not trying to make it good. That being said, it's in theaters currently. I thought the what? And some theaters now. Oh. In Portland, Oregon, right now it's in theaters. Random, but okay. I give this trailer a yay, because I like, as we just saw today, I like bad films, apparently. <laughs> I, I'm going to give it a nay. But, Josh, we have good horror news. Good? 
Uh, a horror thriller film produced by Jordan Peele's Monkey Paw Productions will release on September 27th, 2024. This is really cool. Big yay. Jordan Peele's doing amazing stuff. I'm excited for anything he's producing. Yay, yay. indeed. We have Disney-related news, two pieces of Disney news, one of which I'm really excited about, and that is Maya Kealoha has been cast as Lilo in Disney's live-action Lilo and Stitch remake. I don't want Disney remakes, but she would be great. I can already feel it. Yes. Uh, she looks exactly, exactly like the character first off. Like, great casting on that front. She's the right age. She seems really energetic and fun. She's actually Hawaiian, like you should be for this role. Great job with that. Dwayne Johnson and Ali will return for Disney's live-action Moana remake. Not six. This is announced not even six years after the first movie came out. I am so fucking done with these goddamn remakes. This is ridiculous at this point. Like, I get Disney is, like, not as financially stable as they once were, but this is not the route Bob Iger should be going down. This is going to affect them badly, because this is so recent, too. People are not going to go to it the same way they're going to go to The Little Mermaid. Like, this is not going to work in his favor. And then Dwayne Johnson is most likely going to be Maui again, and, I mean, fine, whatever, but it's just, it's not going to work. If they cast Ali'i as 16-year-old Moana, how do you feel despite she, her being 22? She, she, a, she's too old, and B, the character wasn't 16, the character was 14. She was still a child. According to Google, she was 16. Well, whatever, she was still a child. Get get an actual teenager. And also, someone, yeah. someone pointed this out, that the water is going to look worse in the live action, and I fully agree with that. It's going to look <laughs> bad. It'll be interesting. I give this news to be some day. I don't, I don't want this to be made at all. I don't. I want these remakes to stop. I want Disney to try live action, actual like different original live action stuff. Because I was looking back at the last like original live action stuff they were doing, and from like Pirates of the Caribbean to when the remake trend started, like there was different ideas and like interesting ideas. A lot of them didn't work, but they were at least trying things. And I think like the last nail in the coffin for those was the Lone Ranger movie they did with Johnny Depp and Army Hammer, like. That one was just a weird one for them to do, and that was kind of like the nail in the coffin for that. And then Alice in Wonderland made a billion dollars. They're like, let's go that route. Let's try that out. And here we are today. Also, I feel like that Dwayne Johnson was kind of like the one at the forefront of this because, like, now he doesn't have Fast and Furious, really. He doesn't have DC anymore. Look at him. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have DC anymore. And so now he's just like, I guess I'll do this. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we have Kingsman 3 potential news, Josh. I want Kingsman 3 now. Ted Edgerton says he has ideas for Kingsman 3 that he's looking to pitch to Matthew Vaughn. He said, I think that will be happening soon, but he has the build in motion on his big idea of his own. So who knows, you know? Which means also that Matthew Vaughn's working on Kingsman 3 right now. I, I say yes. I would love a third film to like kind of wrap up Eggsy's story. I think it'd be very cool to see what they could do. I love Eggsy. I think he's great. I love Kingsman I'd love a third one. I liked The King's Man more than you did, but I think we both agree it was still at least fine. It was uh, fine. Uh, I think that overall, I am excited for the future of this franchise still. Yes. Yay! Yay. Now we have Star Wars news. First things first, you like everything everyone all at once in Swiss Army Man? Yes. According to The Hollywood Reporter, the, and now officially the Daniels themselves, they com are confirmed to be directing Star Wars Skeleton Crew. At least one episode of. Nice. The show. Uh, and I'm excited to see what they do with that world. It'll be weird for sure. It's going to be interesting to see how their style clashes with whatever the vision for the show is. Because it's either going to blend really well or they're going to be very restricted in doing it. So I'm curious to see what they'll get to do with it. Yeah, Daniel Kwan said, don't worry, we aren't working on the whole series. Uh, we guest directed one episode. John Watts approached us to do an episode a while ago before everything ever all at once even came out. We love John, love Star Wars, love learning new tech. So it was an easy yes. We shot it last year, and we had an incredible time working with the most talented cast and crew, and I'm excited for all of you to see it. Our next film will be an original project, um, so you can stop worrying and stop bothering me about it. <laughs> <laughs> First off, a gig is a gig. <laughs> also, the dude just won three Oscars. Like, like he'll be fine. <laughs> so yay on them making a Star Wars thing, because that seems like a fun world for them to play in. Yes, for but, sure. But imagine how cool it would be. They got to direct a Star Wars movie, though, not just an episode of a TV show. Like, that would be so cool. If episode 10 was by them. No, I don't want a saga film. I just want a standalone film set well, in the universe. 
it's rumored right now at, at Star Wars Celebration this this month we're gonna get three more uh, saga films. I just that's announced. A, that's a terrible idea, but given Disney's track record, I would not be surprised. But if they were all by the Daniels, Josh, how would you feel then? I'd be confused. I wouldn't be against it. I would just feel bad for them because then their lives would become a living hell. I have Owen Wilson news. Great! He gives me more positive vibes. He will return as Morbius. Not Morbius. He will return as Mobius in Deadpool 3. Yes! Yay? Yay. Supposedly the plot of Deadpool 3 will be, the, will be about the TV inter, uh, intervening after what happened in Deadpool 2. You know what? I'm down for that. And that will be a good way to tie into the MCU now. Is, is he just going to... Is Deadpool then just going to kidnap Wolverine and be like, Hey, these guys are after me. Could you kill them for me? I really hope he's capturing Hugh Jackman the actor still. I really hope that's what it is. <laughs> but yay on Mobius coming back? Yes. And of course, because Timey Wimey could happen before everything that happened with Kang, etc. You know, it, it could Loki. be a different timeline, different universe. It could be. Any we don't version. know how it works now. As long as he's and got more, the mustache, I'm fine with it. I have more confusing MCU news, though. More. With Liv Tyler returning as Betty Ross for Captain America: New World Order, aka the Hulk movie number two. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting move they're pulling. This, this movie has the leader Betty Ross, uh, <laughs> Red Hulk, and. It's about, like, uh, this Gamma stuff, apparently. I'm like, what's happening? Now, t- now, to be fair, most comics, like, there's characters fight other characters' villains and have crossovers with them all the time. It is a very common thing. It shouldn't be for Sam's first outing as being a Captain America. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that's how it is a lot of times in comics. I'm willing to bet Liv Tyler is just in that end, that end scene of a funeral, which is most likely what it is. I don't know. But... I honestly don't think that she gave a great performance as Betty in Incredible Hulk. I think it was a directing thing because I recently rewatched Lord of the Rings and she's great in that. Oh, she's and, fantastic in that. And it's weird because like every line she gives in Incredible Hulk, it sounds like she's out of breath. <laughs> I, I right. saw someone like their one complaint about Harrison Ford being President Ross. He's just like, he doesn't have the mustache. How are they going to explain that? And I know it was like clearly as a joke, but I know there's going to be people that will be like that. I think he's going to have a mustache in it. Doesn't he's his, it, have you seen the set photos? His face is clean. Are you serious? Are you getting that's mad? A, he doesn't have a mustache. <laughs> that's the one thing I care about for Ross to have. It's a mustache. <laughs> that's his defining trait of a character. That's a problem, and that's his defining trait. Then, anyway, do you want to hear some DC news? I mean, I guess we have Titans news, your favorite show of all time. Did you see that Superboy is bald now in the show? I did not see that part. It's weird. I have not caught up at all. <laughs> Do you see that uh, there's Arrowverse characters from like, the show Arrow and Flash appearing on the Superman Lois show? Uh, I know there was like, no. Um... J- John Diggle from Arrow, one of the characters, is now on Superman Lois. And oh. talking about Oliver Queen and stuff. Uh, okay, I guess. Weird, right? Uh, but you saw the the first look at uh, Jay Lacurgo Lecur- as Robin in the final season of Titans. Uh, the image with him in his suit? So good. It's the costume design on that show is pretty, pretty damn good. That is cinema quality Tim and Drake Robin suit. It it's upsettingly good. It also looks just like a comic book suit. Like like it looks like it comes right out of a page. It it pops. I love the bright red on the chest. I love that the it's, the lining of the suit is tiny, tiny, tiny R's. That's how it is for all three Robin suits. And I never noticed that till like the other day. The yeah the first. If you look at the first uh, Dick Grayson Robin suit, it's just ours everywhere. I'm like, it's really funny to look at. Uh, but because well, most suits have a textures patterns on them to help you know make it look better on camera, but like, they didn't know what to do, so just ours. Why not? Uh, yay on the suit! I'll give that the yay. I'll give it a yay. The costume design on the show has always been good. We have other kind of costumey news. We saw on-set photos, videos, and now official picture of Lady Gaga on set for her. Uh, Harley Quinn. Nope, on set for Joker 2. Fully ado. And she was dancing up the stairs in one of a shot. I saw that. I'm just like, so we're going back to the Joker stairs? <laughs> we're really doing this? Yep. I'm like, okay. You know that- if it's like in a musical <laughs> sequence, okay, I'll allow it. That's That makes sense for something like that. If it was just like a normal scene of like them talking and like her doing that, I'm just like, what what's happening here? She's going to look at court. A bunch of pro- protesters outside. A woman shouts, you're going to hell. And then she goes and kisses that woman and says, hey, you're going with me. I like that line. I'm just curious, like, what happens, like, from the beginning of the movie to that, that that transpires. I'm very curious to see 
Harley's transformation in this, because it's not obviously going to have the whole vat of acid and everything like that. Edgar Wright says, Brian Leo Malley, his direction for the Scott Pilgrim anime, is way more adventurous than just a straight ad- adaptation of the books. Everyone is coming back from the original movie to voice their characters. Everyone. Allison Pill as Kim Klein, Brie Larson as Edvy Adams, Anna Kendrick as Stacey Pilgrim, uh, Aubrey Paws as Julie Powers, Brandon Routh, Todd Ingram, Ellie Wong, Knives Chow, May Whitman, Roxy Richer, Mark Webber, Stephen Stills, Johnny Simmons as Young Neil, Jason Schwartzman as Gideon Graves, I, uh, Chris Evans as Lucas Lee, fantastic, Kieran Culkin as Wallace Wells, Satya Baba as Mattel, P- Matthew Patel, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Ramona Flowers, and Michael Sarah as Scott Pilgrim. They're all coming back. It is very cool to me that Mega Stars now, they're like, oh yeah, I'll come back for that. I love doing it. I just think this is fantastic. It's also, um, it's really funny when you think back to when it came out, most of the, you know, people in that weren't like super huge Mega Stars. Like there was only like a right? few that were. Great casting director, yeah. originally. I am so excited to see what the animation style for this is going to be like. Uh, so yay on this ca- uh, cast announcement? Oh, of course. The writer of Josh Freeman of I've Heard of the Way of Water is set to write the script for Fantastic Four for the MCU. Well, I'm excited no. for it because he's also, you know, written for the Planet of the Apes prequels movies. Like the Matt Reeves ones? Yeah. Oh, never mind. Now it's a yay. <laughs> I don't like Way of Water that much. I don't like you after film that much. You did, a, you did a 180 on it, and you'll probably 180 again in a year. So we'll see. <laughs> I'll give a yay for Apes, nay for Avatar. <laughs> So yeah, Josh, thoughts? I'll I'll give it a yay, and it's it's very clear that Feige is you know taking the criticisms of like Ant Man, like the VFX stuff, and like he's taking all that, and be like, all right, we're gonna you know bring in some writers, rework rework some stuff, and like you know pause things, hold things, like taking our time and like fixing it, because he wants this stuff to work, and he wants people to you know like everything. He's not just gonna be like, eh, who cares? Just push things out, and it's it's, it's fine. No. He loves what he does, and he loves this, these characters and worlds, and he wants to make sure that people love him too. So he's going to put in the work to make sure that's the case. And, you know, getting well, getting one of the writers of, you know, the biggest movie, you know, of the past several years, that's a smart move. Yeah. On paper, it makes sense. I I do like the idea that the best part, the best part of the Avatar films was the family aspect, and it's Fantastic Four is all about family, so I guess that part's fine. Yeah. I have Harry Potter news, I guess. Sadly. Fuck J.K. Rowling. Fuck you, J.K. Rowling. You are... You literally said that... Do you see her Twitter ever, Josh? Do you ever, do you ever look at her Twitter? No, I never do. That's that's for the best. Uh, she's terrible. But we're getting a Harry Potter reboot in the works of HBO, where each... Uh, it's a TV TV show, and each season of the series will be based on one of seven books. Which, I've heard the idea of around for a decade now. And... I don't know. It's too late. So here's the thing. All the J.K. Rowling shit aside, this is a terrible idea. For one thing, not only will you have, you know, seven plus years terrible backlash and everything f- for it because of J.K. Rowling, but also, like, the movies are as perfect of an adaptation as you can get of this stuff. Plus, you know, it's still insanely popular in people's minds. Like, what would you be doing? Would you be referencing, like, here's a nod to, like, the films. Here's, like, a little bit of the original score and, like, all this stuff. All you're doing is just going to be basing off of people's nostalgia. What are you going to do? What are you going to do for the sets of Hogwarts? Like, you would have to completely redesign it, and it's going to mess with people's minds. They're going to hate it. Because they have Harry Potter World already. They're not going to it. Exactly. Like, parks. Like, there are so um, many things that they haven't thought about that are going to become a problem. The top reply to the tweet about this says, Wingardium, absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> Agree, agreed. Uh, like, and, and I have not seen a single person so far that's like, yes, I'm so excited for that, because no one wants it. When it happens and they see the first trailer, they're going to be like, wait, why are they doing this again? I was just watching the movies not too long ago. Like, they stand the test of time because they Radcliffe, were very well made. I guarantee Radcliffe will be playing uh, James Potter. I th- I think Radcliffe has the smart sensibility to stay away from Harry Potter at this no, point. No, I know. I meant, to say they, I meant to say they'd probably approach him for that role. Oh, probably. He's going to be like, N- no. <laughs> He wants. He's. Do you see him leading uh, a discussion about uh, trans youth? Yeah, because he's and a good human being and wants to learn I, and grow. I loved him, Radcliffe, and he was like being a moderator for a discussion that was so cool. Uh, nay on this news, big nay, big hard nay for so many different reasons. Warner Brothers, I get you're stupid right now, but this is completely moronic. Guarantee you, 
they will announce Lord of the Rings is being remade. Guarantee you. I don't know when, but they're gonna do it. So, we have news about Black Adam, and Zachary Levi, and Dwayne Johnson, some, and... Some weird beef? Uh, what the fuck? So, Dwayne Johnson vetoed, because he had the power to do this, apparently, he vetoed a post credit scene for Shazam! Fear of the Gods, a movie he is not a part of, um, that would have included Aldous Hodges, Hawkman, and other heroes from Shazam, uh, other heroes from Black Adam, introducing Shazam into the JSA, and doing this, basically... The scene we got at the end of Shazam, not spoiler for Shazam, don't worry, really. Um, but instead, uh, Black uh, Black Adam actor Dwayne Johnson said, no, you can't do that. You can't make him even related to our movie. It's like, motherfucker, you are the main antagonist of this character. You're designed the same way. Your word to transform is the same. And apparently there's been a lot of beef about this back and forth and how Dwayne Johnson really does not want to have anything to do with at all uh, Zachary Levi or Shazam. Like... What? Why'd you take this role then? I So here's my theory on this. Back when he was cast back in 2007, this was when, before he had his career resurgence, I'm willing to bet that back then, if Shazam had come out and like he was still Black Adam, he would be like, oh yeah, I can't wait to fight Shazam. It's going to be an awesome fight between the two of us. Like He would have fully embraced it. It would have been like, yes, I'm very excited for that. But now, you know, jumping ahead almost two decades later, he's done you know everything that he's done. His ego has inflated to massive heights where he has to be the center of attention and everything. That he's just like, no, 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 no. I'm the biggest, baddest motherfucker around. So I got to fight the biggest, baddest motherfucker. And that guy is Superman, not Shazam, that puny child. No, no, no. Superman. I'm just like, what? <laughs> Even though Shazam slash Captain Marvel has the exact same powers as you, Black Adam. Same same powers, same suit design, same word to transform, the same concept. Uh, nay on all this news. I don't like it. <laughs> it it doesn't it doesn't matter now with like the DC universe changing and everything, but this well, is we'll still see. really stupid. It's we will it's, see. It's not gonna matter. Look at the box I office. Know. <laughs> I know. We'll get into that. It's my next thing. <laughs> so Josh, it's time for our chat. Our little sit down tea time about Shazam: Fury of the Gods. Let's talk about box office first because I have that in my notes. <laughs> I'm I'm genuinely shocked at how poor this did. Uh, it earned in its open worldwide opening weekend sixty five million. And now, like, uh, I don't even think that and it's then, it's not made much sense. <laughs> right, and then week two, uh, earned two point three five million, an eighty percent decline from the last weekend. And, like, declines, like, from opening weekend to the next weekend, it's a very common thing. It happens in everything. But with how low that start is to go from to that low, that's bad. And now David F. Sandberg, uh, not related to the decline at all, um, legitimately not related to it at all, he said that he is very eager to go to horror as well as trying new things. After six years of Shazam, I'm definitely done with superheroes for now, which is completely fair. And it's also insane to think about, like, he's right. They filmed the first one in 2017. It didn't come out till mid-2019. A Christmas movie, mind you, it comes out in April. And that's that's already bad sign number one. Bad sign number two, it had bad marketing. And now, you know, this one, uh, COVID, you know, stuff aside, they filmed it back in 2021. And then Warner Brothers, you know, in 2022 was just like, we're going to release it the same weekend as Avatar all the way at the end of the year. And then they're like, actually, we don't have the money to do that. Uh, Push it back a bit. And then they were just like, okay, we're going to release it in March against everything else. Uh, We're also going to not market it in the slightest. And then also the January announcement of like the new DC Universe stuff didn't really help that much. And then... Yeah. Well, this is, this is both in and not in the DCU. Actually, it, was, it will not be because it's before the Flash in context. Yeah. This is, remember, this leads into the Flash film, which it really doesn't at all. No, not um, the slightest. <laughs> it's such a combination of like poor marketing, management, just like not caring at all about the brand. And like this, also, I'll get into this a bit when we talk about the movie, but I think because of all these delays and everything, it made the story weaker for it. I never liked the suit change in this movie, but they only did it to make us match with Black Adam. And then Black Adam didn't happen with it. Oh my god, you're right. Like, the, and, the, the the lightning bolt is a bit smaller, but, like, yeah, the texture change and everything, like, lines up a lot better with Black Adams. Yeah, the, the suit, the cape, every single part of this now is to match with the Black Adam movie design of the suit. Because this, the cartoony, fun, vibrant suit wouldn't match with Black Adams. It has to look the same. 
Um, uh, and what's funny to me about that is they even, in a flashback scene, they retcon the old suit, so it's this, this new suit, too. Remember how Shazam 3 was supposed to be, you know, Shazam versus Black Adam? Remember how Shazam 2 was supposed to be that? I thought that was, I thought that wasn't the plan. Uh, originally, originally it was. Before oh. They, and they, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. When the first Shazam came out, that was what they, were, what they were talking about, was in the second one with Black Adam. It's... And then that got delayed because Dwayne Dawson had other issues and stuff, and then et cetera. Um, but yeah, they, they they do a flashback of this movie where they show the Shazam suit, but they clearly reshot that same scene with the new suits. I didn't, which is so I didn't, weird. I didn't notice that they uh, redid the suits. I just noticed that um, that Mary was changed out for Grace, that's playing her in this one. That was the yeah, only Grace that was the only change that I noticed. Watch if you watch when you watch it again. Look at that scene. They changed the suits to the new ones. So it, it, these were always the suits. Is the idea? I mean, that doesn't that doesn't bother me. But it's just it's it's, just, it's interesting. It isn't because the suits canonically can't change their look ever because it's their magic and they just appear on them. They can't get new suits. I still love that the first movie there's that the only solution Billy could think of for going to the bathroom in the suit was just to transform. Well, it's the only solution. Like actually. Why can't they take it off then? What's the reason? Magic. That's dumb. Like it's, it's literally how it's like that's part of their form, basically. That's dumb. They're not. They're not just costumes. Yeah, like that's what they have to. What they and in that form, they are as a, like a, a god, basically. And that's how they have to look. Also, this will be a non-spoiler discussion, everyone, for a while. We'll, we'll talk about the spoilers. We'll address that, right, Josh? Yes. There are and things. There are timestamps down below that you can skip around. Because there are spoilery things we'll not get into, don't worry. But starting our discussion now, overall yay or nay on this movie, Josh, Fury of the Gods. I give it a yay. I had a very fun time with it. It's not as good as the first one, but I honestly really liked it. I agree. I don't know if it's bad. I don't care if it's bad. Oh, I it's, had fun it's not again. Bad. Well, I don't I don't I need to see it again. Cause I don't know how I feel about a lot of scenes in this movie. I think the whole Skittles product placement is very funny. Um, <laughs> I the nephew of the gods, my guy. I think there's a lot of interesting things in this movie. I think it has a lot of problems, but overall, I think it's really fun, and it sticks to having fun the whole time and being sincere about it. Yes, and I like that. So I I think my biggest criticism of the movie is because they filmed this back in 2017, the kids were actually children. And, you know, that's kind of the whole thing with Shazam is that they're kids that get transformed into, like, their perfect adult forms to be these, you know, godlike figures. But, you know, they don't film again for another four to five years. You know, they kind of have growth spurts and go through puberty. Asher Angel was fucking 18 when he filmed this. And so, like, now you lose that aspect of it. And so because of that, we barely see them as their, you know, kid forms. So most of the film, they are in their adult forms, which it really it gives this big disconnect to me to like the heart of the film about this family. Cause that's one of, sh that's one of Billy's things in this is that he's worried about like, you no, know, cause he's going to be 18 soon. He's going to age out of the foster system and he doesn't feel like he has a family. And I'm like, I mean, if we got to see you more in this movie with the family, that would be f cool. But you know, everyone's an adult. So we kind of can't really do that. Cause it's not really believable. And they kind of address the, it's been two years now. It's been more than two years. It's Eugene sprouted like a weed. <laughs> Eugene looked like five or eight, and now he's like, oh, well, you're an adult. <laughs> it's very bizarre. I tell you this every single time we talk about Shazam, but they don't turn into their adult selves. They turn into adults, because they turn into perfect versions of what they could be, but it's never like, it's not who they would grow into. It's like... Uh, well, maybe it's a self-love thing with her, then, that she's already perfect the way <laughs> she is. Like Captain Marvel slash Shazam, like the main guy, Billy Batson version. The red one. Um, <laughs> the red one? <laughs> yeah, the Red Ranger. Uh, he, the adult version of him, isn't what Billy would grow up to be. It's what he pictures his dad to look like. Oh. And that's like a, a core part of like, it. Like, it's, they look like kind of, kind of what they imagine themselves a little bit to be. And it's all these other things and it's a bunch of factors. It's not them. It's like a, an avatar. A dude, like it's a, a vessel. And so it's having her just grow into herself, like, oh, that's kind of not lore accurate, but you want to keep the same actor around, and I get that. And it would probably look weird to most audiences otherwise. But having Billy, who's a man, grow into just a different man also does feel weird. Yeah. It's... 
Uh, it's it's little things like that that don't really annoy me so much with they it. They should have just cast Yunga from the start. Well, they did. <laughs> they did. No. I mean, Asher should have been younger the first movie. Well, he I think. Been. Well, I think the idea was like you know if things you know worked correctly, they would have been like you know two years later they would have made another one, and so he would have you know aged up well for it. But no, five years later, that makes more sense. <laughs> uh it's very weird. The plot. Rachel Zegler's in it. Yes, that's the whole plot, right? The only plot. The only plot that matters. And Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu. Lucy Liu is having so much fun. Yeah. Yeah, so there. it's been two years now, and they're now called the Philadelphia Fiasco as the five superheroes, or six, I mean. I do six, think it's five, funny that in, like, two years, they still haven't been able to figure out a name for their group and a name for Billy. Well, they can't say his name. They can't say Captain Marvel, apparently, and that still bothers me. Yeah, for legal <laughs> reasons, and it makes sense. <laughs> Well, in some media, they still say it, like some animated stuff. Well, maybe it's a whole rights um, thing with that. I don't know. Because, like, in the first one, it feels like a nod, like, we can't say Captain Marvel, guys. Uh, and this one's like, well, we still can't say it. Isn't it funny? <laughs> and, like, Shazam has always been the stupid name for his character to me because he can't say it. Yeah. Like, he can't, like, a news conference, what do we call you? Shazam! Shit. <laughs> like, like, like at least call him like Captain Thundercrack. Stick with it, you know. Red, Ra just call him Red Ranger. At this point, uh, people have a lot of problems with Billy not matching up with Levi. I've never had an issue with either film with that, honestly. I I've never had a problem with it because I because I I don't know if it was you I was talking to or some someone about it. It was me and Todd, and I was well, I think you're agreeing with me mostly on that one. Yeah, like Billy. When he transforms into you know Shazam, that he becomes more free and like because yeah. of, and like because of that he acts more like you know an idiotic kid because he's just like whoa it's so cool I have all these powers and stuff like that's exactly what a kid would do if he was in that situation. You think I would be stressed about my rent if I could turn into a superhero? No, I just fly around. Like e <laughs> like even Freddy does it. Like when Freddy transforms, he's like he's acting like he's the coolest motherfucker around. Like and it's just like I'm so cool, I'm so suave, and like all this kind of stuff because that's what he would do. In fact, once Freddy gets powers in the uh, in this one, you can see how much he hates being himself. Otherwise, that's what happened to Billy in the first of them. Yeah, because he already had so much pressure on him, and he literally had in the first movie no home. No family, nothing going for him. He had to go to school and all that stuff. When he could just say a word and make all that go away, and all those problems go away, he could just be he could be loved by people. The best thing about being Shazam slash Captain Marvel in the first movie was that he could get attention and praise and find people who cared about him. That's all he wanted was people to care about him, and he got that when he got from the, from the people of the city in the first one. And in this one, it, it's this it, he's able to be free. It's when he's most comfortable. Because yeah. when he's a kid, he's scared about losing everything. As an adult superhero, he's just able to have fun. I do think it's weird that he has an obsessive crush on Wonder Woman as Captain Marvel, but as a kid, it's never addressed. Well, again, this kind of goes into the thing of, like, there's very, very few scenes with them as kids, so you can't really explore We have, like, two billion that. scenes. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, two billion scenes. Yeah. But... But yeah, similar to like with Billy like wanting to be free, like I feel like that's very similar to Freddy, um, because like when he meets Rachel Zegler's character, he believes her to be, you know, just a normal student at school. And he has his physical disability, and so he's constantly getting picked on and everything. So but being when he's when he's in his Shazam form, he feels like he can be worthy of love because he doesn't have any of those imperfections and everything. Also, much like Luigi in our earlier discussion, he falls in love fast. <laughs> yes. I think it's overall a really fun movie. I think this movie embraces being silly and cartoonish and comic booky. Is I you can tell Sandberg really loves these characters and wants to make a very fun movie with it. I think that overall, Freddy is still still the standout character in both movies. Oh, for sure. Um, I do think there are at times times where uh Billy is acting a little too childish. Oh, uh, not Billy. Uh, Captain Marvel Shazam. But my only issue with that is. It's stuff like spelling or just him being dumb. They, made, they showed a few scenes with Billy as a kid also being dumb and making those same mistakes. That's all you had to do to, to make that make sense yeah. to me. But again, he's an adult, so he can't really have those scenes. <laughs> right. I think he had a really good a moment with his mom up at the end with the crying. I'm not going to spoil what happened there. That was great. Good emotional moment. 
minor, minor, so it's not a spoiler because this, this character is in almost the entire movie. Uh, so I'm not really spoiling anything here, but uh, Jaiman Hunso comes back. Hunsu? I think it's Ren's name. Something like that. Uh, as the wizard. If you remember the first movie, he was Ash. He, he kind of turned into Ash. <laughs> and I forget. Did they explain that fully still? I don't think they did. I think they said they, so. they they did. I don't remember what it was. But I need to watch it again. Because Freddy like is just like, oh wait, I thought you died, or Billy told me like you died or something like that, and then he explains it in some way. He's like, Magic! I did magic, I'm wizard. <laughs> it was a fascinating time. I looked at the cave, the Rock of Eternity is now just a fun like man cave layer for kids. Yeah, because they have a layer now. I really like that Eugene was mapping out the the room of like a thousand doors or whatever that was. That was really cool. I like that a lot. I love every character. I love Mary, like Pedro. I love Darla still. She's still adorable in both version, both movies. Uh, overall, great cast, having a lot of fun. I like it a lot. Oh yeah, this this was so much fun, and I love the the villains of this. Uh, but they are having so much fun. Do you wish we got more of any of those characters? Because Helen Mirren didn't do a lot. Yeah, I I think I would have liked a a big not well I guess a bit clearer and stronger motivation. Um, cause at first I thought that it was about that, like, uh, kids took the powers, like, of their, of their father or something like that. They wanted to get them back. That's not really what it was. That's part of it. It's not really a focus though. It's just kind of like, no. yeah, we, we kind of wanted our powers back to, and then the kids can't have it anymore, but it's not really that. I love that the first movie and choices characters made in the first movie have actual crossover stakes to this movie. Yeah. I was actually like, oh dang. Okay. And like yeah, I like the that's... wizard gets mad at him about it. And he's just like, dude, you never told me about that. <laughs> you melted. <laughs> we have no discussion happen. You you told me to say your name, and then you said that hey, you gotta go find you know stop this guy. Okay, bye, peace out. It's just like you gave me no instructions at all what to do. <laughs> so you did all these bad things. Yeah, I wasn't known. I didn't know any of this stuff. I was ten, or I should have been ten. I was fifteen. I was a child. <laughs> a lot of the adults versus the kids their voice matches up well inflections and tone i think his voice and Ash's voice Ash's voice is deeper than zach's voice it is and, it and is a bit strange and that's in both films actually i think his voice is just generally deeper like a deeper tone to it i think that's probably the biggest weird thing to be between the two characters it's like oh because like darla's is consistent uh pedro's is consistent like qg and, and mary and freddie they all have a very consistent like tonality to their tones and both both adults and kids but for Zach and for Asher, it's just not. And that's part of the disconnect for me of making them feel like different characters, honestly, is their voice. Yeah, I can understand that. But again, he's not that different no. from what we see in either film to me. And I, I, I understand the criticism, but I think if you just look at him, him being more comfortable, feeling safe, feeling freer, then yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like, and I feel like that in scenes when he's confronting like uh helen and lucy like he has a very like cocky attitude about him and like yeah that makes sense he's been doing this for you know two years now and like he feels far more comfortable in it than he did in the last one because like the last one he was just kind of more really figuring out what to do and now he's just like i know what to do i'm so cool i've seen all the fast furious movies you don't know how this is going to go down and you know it doesn't always go his way i wish they addressed the superman thing in the first movie though i want to know how they at least how they met or Something, maybe like a consequence, like a crossover stake or consequence from that <laughs> maybe, happening. Maybe it was like in Black Adam, Waller showed up with a hologram drone. And it was just like, hey, you better be careful. I've got, I've got Superman on my leash now. I'm just like, what? That's that's always <laughs> been that's always been the weirdest thing about that Black Adam post credit scene is that Waller just like now knows Superman. I'm just like, weren't you trying to make a team to kill the man? Bruh, none of none of Black Adam makes sense. What do you mean? Uh, that's that's true. And, it, and again, just like uh, back to Black Adam for no reason at all. Shaz <laughs> Shazam, um, in that movie, they very heavily imply that the person that released the Seven Deadly Sins was oh, Black person, Adam. Yeah. yeah. And in in the Black Adam movie. Seven Deadly Sins aren't in it at all. Nothing at all related to it. Dwayne Johnson just yeah. did what he wanted. Like the first movie was the reason that he was chosen wrong in the, in the Shazam movie was because he released the sins. That's all it was. And you know, as the Black Eyed movie showed, we we're gonna ignore all the Shazam lore because because he uh, he killed. So that's why he was locked away. You could you could just brought back Jaimon Hunso again from the first for Black Adam, but nope. 
I also think Rachel Zegler's power is one of the coolest fucking powers in, in TV. Oh, yeah, she movies. just she just inceptions the world, and it's so cool. The power of Axis. Like, that's... It's so cool. I love it. Uh, well, I guess we gotta get into that when we get into spoilers, uh, but I think... Can we get spoilers now? Yeah, I guess we can. Yeah, spoiler time. Here's your warning. If you are not prepared for it, suck it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not prepared for spoilers, remember, go watch the movie... But anyway, it happened, and here's spoilers. Josh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I thought that one of the coolest parts was when she turns against her sisters, and Lucy Liu tries to, you know, zap her with the magic taking away stick, um, and she, you know, inceptions the world. She's like, haha, you can't get me, but the bolt follows her everywhere, and it still gets her. I thought that was so cool. It, it goes through the buildings. That was, like, that was so cool. What? Stop? If it's a straight line. I, when she sees it coming, she doesn't move. Yeah. I mean, you know. It's fine. It's, yeah, it's fine. Uh, overall, really cool things there. I really enjoy, like I said, the uh, relationship between those two. I love that uh, they have the power to take away any one of, the, of their powers. Yeah. And that's that's really cool to me. That's actually a really cool uh, stake uh, that they have. And also the power to give them back. Because, you know, say my name. Say Sam. Yeah. Really, really cool. Uh, so the consequence in the last film brought over this one is that at the end of the last film... Billy broke the wizard's staff. And what we didn't know then, what he didn't know, because the wizard didn't tell him, was that it also was a, a way to keep a magical barrier between different worlds. Yeah, so and it, that's broken. It, and so it released the daughters of Atlas. As well as potentially other threats we yes. don't even know about. And it did, at least their monsters were ended up coming in too, because they placed a, a golden apple, like from Minecraft. Uh it was fun. I like that the Skittles were the nectar of the closest thing we have to the nectar of the gods. Yeah. What it's, an ad. It's it's blame product placement, but my favorite aspect of that scene was the unicorns. And Me too. I, and I love Sandberg just went full horror route with it. It's just like, all right, I'm going to put unicorns in it, but they're going to be like demonic beings. <laughs> and that'll be the uh, most scary thing here. The only thing, they, only thing they contain them is the nectar of the gods. Okay, closest thing we have to the nectar of the gods is Skittles. Taste the rainbow. What the fuck was that? <laughs> I don't care. I loved it. It was fun. I loved... Darla's great. Darla is great. Uh, I love that the whole part of the plot is, is Freddy uh, and wanting to be on it, flying on his own. The other kids wanting to move out of the house and do their own thing, like how Mary decided not to go to college to be with the family more and all that stuff, which isn't really addressed enough. I wish they would delve more into that. I think she said she addressed like that there was a, that they filmed a scene and that it was cut or something like that. Which you got there, okay. there are moments of that. And it, it really feels like it's around a lot of the family stuff. Was that stuff was Absolutely. filmed and it was cut? I want to know why a lot of stuff was cut. Maybe it was runtime, I guess. But it was interesting. I don't know. Give me the the Sandberg cut. Yeah. Hashtag release the Sandberg cut. Oh my god. If you still tweet release the air cut ironically, please stop. If you please. if you tweet sell Snyderverse and Netflix, please go touch grass. Restore the Snyderverse. Um, I thought this was interesting. It, I love that Freddy is still his best friend, and early on, uh, when Freddy's gonna go on a call, Freddy still wants it to be just just him and, and Billy. Yeah. Like, I, I love that, because that's how it started, which is those two together. And I, for Freddy, like, like, even on superheroes, he wants to still be with them. I loved that. This is a testament to one of the writers of this, uh, is the writer of the Fast and Furious series. And there's one thing this dude understands. It is family. And that is, a you know, the central th thing with this movie is family. And it gets it so well. And I'm very happy with that. One of my favorite running jokes in the movie is that lightning keeps striking their house because they keep shazamming you oh, know, I there. Love that. And the parents are just like, why does lightning keep striking our house? What is happening? I love that they have no courtesy to go outside and do it. Yes! They just do it in the house. Apparently, in, you know the scene where they're all together walking out of the house the first time and shazam together? Uh-huh. That was a, a reshoot because it couldn't get all of them on set together for so long. Luca was happening, etc. And so, like, all these different people were doing different movies and shows because they're all gaining popularity, which is great for the actors. Hard for an ensemble film. Yeah. It's it's almost like, you know, waiting several years for a movie like this to, you know, film, and everyone's just like, we've got other things to do. Wasn't the brightest idea. I, think I really love the fact that the, this movie opens with so much murder. There's a lot of death. In a museum? Oof. We also get Gal Gadot in this movie. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, yeah. So Ray, if uh, Bill, Billy <laughs> dies, 
Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a sec, but I'm still pissed that Warner Brothers just had no faith in this movie whatsoever and didn't market it. They're like, we'll, t- we'll tease that Wonder Woman's in the movie. That'll get people to go see it, and that's all we'll do for marketing. I'm like, that's a stupid idea. For a- She's in the movie for two, two scenes. scenes. And the no. first one isn't even her. No, the first one's definitely a body double, and then the second one she says like three lines, and that's right at the very end. And she gains a new power of reviving people. Well, she had the magic staff. Does that make it better? I don't know. know. (laughs) He sent a letter from a pen that was magical to her. I I, that that was also one of my favorite gags. Was the pen just wrote everything they said, and it it led to so many funny things to me. Yeah, I like to like that they're exploring the Rock of Eternity because it is Eternity. So I wonder how vast this place is. Yeah, and the fact that they had a door the entire time to lead to the other world is really funny to me. That they marked as, eh, because it's just a maze it's a labyrinth, it's, like a Greek just, labyrinth. It's a, it's just a labyrinth, like the Greek kind. Yeah. <laughs> but Billy's death, I, I honestly really liked it. I did until they undid it. Yeah. I mean, I knew they were gonna do it because I was just like, they, they're not gonna kill him. But like everything, like leading up to his sacrifice, and even like you know, the emotions, like afterwards, I'm just like, this is really good and really effective. I'm gonna be mad though that they're gonna undo it. <laughs> See, I, I was hoping they wouldn't do it until I remember the scene about Wonder Woman coming in. Because I, of I, course, it was spoiled. Yeah, I knew she was showing up, and it's like, she didn't show up in the finale, so, like, what's gonna happen here? It would've been funny if they had just the Justice League at his funeral, and that was how that scene was instead. They would, And then some of the members would've just been like, who are we mourning right now? I, see, I also think it's funny that he's not a member after being Superman two years ago. Look, there's a lot of like, things in the DC universe that are... And not, he's, not, he's, like, a pretty consistent member in the comics of the Justice League. It just makes it even worse, though, that they brought him back to life because th- this, with the box office, this is not getting a third film, which is sad to say because, like, I love these characters and I would love to see more done with them, but it's very clear. That's I think we not will get happen. in the new DCU. We will get Shazam slash Captain Marvel later on down the line. A- um, cast actual children and actually make these films like at a consistent level. Right. I love that Michael Gray, uh, who played Billy Batson. In the original Shazam TV show, uh, was in this. He ma- he makes a cameo, and he's in his shirt from that show, his Billy Batson shirt, and he calls him Captain Marvel. <laughs> and that was like, okay, I love that you got around the l- l- loophole very well. And the person who got to come Captain Marvel being Captain Marvel was really fun to me. Yeah, let's talk about the the giant tree and all the monsters and stuff. Yes, I, I love that Sandberg went full Sandberg, which is, like, how gross and disgusting, like, all the different monster variants looked. I thought that was fun. But oh, yeah, Helen Mirren died. Oh, yeah, character. she... Yeah, Lucy Liu uh, turns on her and is just like, haha, I'm gonna take revenge on all the humans for everything that they did to us. And Helen Mirren's just like, ah, uh, that's not really what we agreed upon. Because <laughs> they want to get this Seed of the Gods, which is a golden apple. Um, Yes, like from Minecraft, the golden apple. And they... The, they they plant it in their world. It will rejuvenate their world. Which, yeah, but, makes sense. And it was in the Rock of Eternity. And so they... And Lucy Liu decides to plant it in our world, which our worlds aren't supposed to mix. You know, like the World Engine, for instance, uh, in Man of Steel, but not nearly as... Vwom, vwom, me. Not nearly uh, as 9-11-y. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also a magical dome in this, which I forgot how it came about. Uh, they oh, put from, the they, from Helen Mirren. Yeah, they put the spell over it um, to trap them to be like, how do you like it now, huh? Which is honestly my favorite choice on how to make uh, other heroes not interact with you. Yeah. Because, like, for instance, Throw the Dark World, the world-ending events, no one else goes there. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. And here I'm like, okay, no other Justice League members or something could actually help if they wanted to. Makes sense. And that's why Wonder Woman at the end was there, because... Now she could help. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more dome. There's a giant dragon. So I think it's overall a decently edited film, like well paced for the most part to me. Oh, Freddy was captured. I I also just love that Freddy's will is so strong that he's able to push a fight against like mind melting like torture from gods. 
And not only that, but then there was also the stuff with the dragon where it would literally like made you see like your worst fears and like you literally couldn't move. And the the man was just like was still seeing all that. It was still moving towards Rachel Ziegler. He said, "Try me." Like that man's will is so strong. I he'd be a good green intern. Exactly. <laughs> uh yeah, they place that seed, that golden apple in our world, and a giant tree explodes in, the, in their dome. They're trapped in, and all the heroes are now depowered except for Billy Batson, and they have to find a way to stop these people. And the way they decide to do it is he works the Hellmere to shrink the dome by trapping Lucy Liu and the dragon inside of a smaller area right around the seed, and just starts charging the staff up as well as the area up with lightning until it just gets... A kaboom. Yeah, until it basically becomes a bomb. He knows that it's going to kill him, but he's just like, "There's what What other choice do I have? He's like, and, I broke this staff, not knowingly, but still. And I'm very happy that it actually, like, did kill him. Because, like, there's always the, those movies and stuff that say stuff like that, but then it doesn't end up killing them. It, this one's like, yeah, no, it did kill him. Like, it was that powerful. I really hate them. Who wants their powers back? I do, and they'll get their powers back. I don't like that at all. Um... Because I think a big message of the movie was about moving on, letting go, and like growing up. I feel like that if Sandberg had his way, he probably would go back and change the ending so Billy stays dead and they don't get their powers back. Because I think that would fit way better. It would leave a much better impact. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and be- and he could always bring him back after the Flash because time changed. <laughs> yeah. But again, you have to have a coherent universe, and this does- is not a coherent universe. <sighs> a shame yeah we'll be getting a coherent universe in theory though we'll see in theory i find it interesting that blue beetle is technically the first movie in that universe after the flash because it was already made but somehow batgirl can't work i'm so mad about that i just i don't Uh, like i'm happy blue beetle's getting released i'm very happy but on paper canceling batgirl makes no sense you have a bad family member michael Keane, brendan fraser why would you cancel that it's fraser actually as he keeps saying fraser god damn it (laughs) My tongue is so uh, used to Frasier. <laughs> what a weird way to say that. I don't care. <laughs> but I agree. I do think the Michael Keaton thing is probably why they canceled it part, partly at least. Because he's not part of their plan anymore. It's clear they don't care. So why well, not release it? Oh wait, legal, legally on. now they can't. Well, we'll see. This is a weird time. Shazam was a weird time, I think. Overall weird. A- Antiope, uh, or Anne, who is his girlfriend crush... Who really was endearing toward him? Who, because he stood up to bullies for her, even though he could have, she could just murder them in a, like you know, wave of her hand, um, which she was going to do apparently. <laughs> uh, she was going to rearrange their insides. That's kind of gross. But he stood up for her, and she thought it was sweet, and so she had a crush on him too, even though she's like thousands of years older than him. That kind of weird. <laughs> that was also one of my favorite jokes. Their their mom, because Billy, you know, likes Wonder Woman and he likes her. And their mom was just like, "What is with our boys and older women?" <laughs> right. Interesting choices. And so we get to have. What are your other thoughts on this? And so they capture Freddy, and then he meets the wizard, and they have the whole discussion. They try and break out, etc. And that's what most of the movie is Freddy separated from them and showing how awesome he is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also think I learned that I realized in this movie his crutch. His arm crutches come and go when he says Shazam. Like, they get absorbed with his clothes and stuff, too. I mean, it makes sense. I I actually really like that. Like, it treats it like an accept, like, because all, all their clothes come and go, too. Yeah. So I appreciate that detail. Like, it, it doesn't just fall. Sometimes it does when he drops it, but in general, it stays with him. Like, that's a good detail. Except in the first one, it does just drop, I think. Yeah, but I think, they, I think they did that just more for, like, effect to, like, show. It's just like, oh, he did, did they, did they, oh, he did transform! Good movie. Good movie. Messy movie, but it, good movie. It has its problems. There's there's no denying that. But I I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Um, the first film is better, but I still really like this one. I just wish Warner Brothers actually gave a damn about the series and didn't, you know, release it in the month where there's everything coming out like that was a terrible move on their part right after timing. scream and right before john wick and right before mario too honestly what's what sucks is that they the marketing is so bad that um the theater i worked at that weekend there was like ant-man screenings had more people than shazam did and ant-man you know has been out since february josh what are your last thoughts in this movie 
It is a lot of fun. It is a good time. If you enjoyed the first one, you will enjoy this one. I highly recommend it. It's going to be on digital soon because it did so poorly at the box office because you didn't go see it. Uh, so, yeah, watch it when Why you get the chance. Why are you attacking our audiences? Because what? they didn't go see it, and it's a good movie. You don't know our audience. Well, too bad. I'm going to say things. I feel like our audience would be the people who go see it, honestly. Well, if you didn't see it, I would like an explanation why. Please leave me a five-page essay as to why. You can email us at uh, podgeekspeak at gmail.com to leave an essay for Josh, and he will read it. I'll make him read it. He will make me read it. That's true. I'm I'm very forceful. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say persuasive, but... It works. Um, I'm for... I'm going to shove this essay to you. Ah! Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at the Theater Nerd or on TikTok or Instagram at that Nerd Theater, and that'll be fun. Josh, where can people find you online? I'm at places. I'm on the Instagrams at J underscore Rudy sixteen, Twitter J underscore Rudy twenty eight, and YouTube at Josh Rudolph. This was Shazam: Fury of the Gods and the original Mario movie. What an interesting time! Oh fuck! Ow! Ow! Sorry. Hold on. Stop dying. This was Shazam Fury of the Gods and the OG 93 Mario movie and our news. We not do a decom, we not do a super good story. Mostly because this is a fun little catch-up time for these interesting movies. Yeah. So go check us out and on our social medias and stuff and reach out. And as always, thank you for listening so much. We really appreciate it. Indeed we do. Bye.